Let me ask you this question. Do you ever wonder why people cheat or feel tempted to cheat on expense reports, taxes, exams, or other endeavors? According to a series of research studies that go back uh, to a, a few years, back to 2012, at four major universities, cheating often provides psychological rewards that motivate people to act unethically. Cheating can give many people what researchers um, have labeled a cheater's high. Okay? And so there was one experiment when researchers from the University of Washington's Foster School of Business, they asked subjects to predict how they felt about cheating. And as the researchers had expected, most of the subjects predicted they'd feel bad about cheating. Then they conducted an experiment in which 179 subjects had to unscramble as many words as possible in a 15-minute period. And they earned money for each word that they completed. So there was serious bonus. And when the subjects were offered a chance to cheat, 41% of the participants did so. And right after the test, the participants took another test that measured how good they felt at the moment. And surprisingly, the cheaters reported higher positive feelings than the non-cheaters, such as they were excited. And no difference in negative feelings. There was no guilt than the non-cheaters. So then what they did was they did a second study. And they kind of increased the number of participants, 205 people. But the, dis the results were even more disturbing with this next study. Once again, the participants were given a test. That allowed them the chance to cheat. And once again, the cheaters felt better than the non-cheaters. But this time, the cheaters also rated themselves higher on how they felt clever, capable, accomplished, satisfied, superior. In other words, they not only felt good about cheating, but they were smug about it. So they felt good, but just felt like, yeah, I'm so good, I'm so good. Look at me, I'm so good, right? There was an article in Forbes magazine, and it concluded this. We can add to this study kind of the pantheon of research undermining the idea that humans are good at heart. And we wonder why. Wall Street investment banks stocked with the smartest minds from Ivy League schools all plunged right over like lemmings the same cliff during uh, the credit crisis of a few years before, 2007, 2008. Everybody wants to cheat. They want to find the, the quickest way to get the results. Uh, that they crave. Here's the reality for us. Upside down kingdom citizens are invited and encouraged and challenged to choose the less popular way for the sake of the kingdom. And that less popular way leads to life both here on earth and the life to come. It's hard. It's difficult, and it's a challenge. But in the end, it's God who rewards us for living as he's called us to live. Pray with me. And so, God, when we sing of following you step by step, Lord, when we sing of you being the way maker, Lord, that's going to involve not doing, not living this life in a way um, that we're just kind of doing and getting and becoming what we want, but instead living in a way, Lord, that demonstrates to a watching world that we are following a good and gracious Heavenly Father who wants life eternal for all of us. Be with us now. Open our hearts and minds so we can hear from you and from your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.
when we read here in where we are in, in Matthew's gospel, what we um, find out, the first thing that Jesus talks about uh, beginning here in Matthew 7, verse 13, is this. He says, we enter through the narrow gate. Again, just the, 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 little ver the quick verse that Pastor Bryce shared with us. We enter through the narrow gate. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. Now, it's really important to, re to, to recognize that those listening to Jesus, they would have been more than, more than familiar with, with this idea, this concept of there being two ways of living based on their own exposure and familiarity with the Scriptures. There is no doubt that those who were standing there listening to Jesus, they'd heard this from Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the scoffers, of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. Later on, in Psalm chapter 4, they would have known this verse. It would have been familiar to them too. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. They also would be familiar with writings from Jeremiah, from the book of Jeremiah, where, Jesus, where Jeremiah writes this, Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says, See, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Thus, in this gospel, in this teaching, in this sermon, we've reached a point which I would reference as Jesus' organization of the kingdom, his discourse or his teaching. Jesus is essentially transitioning to what we would call an altar call. That's what he's doing at this point. He's directing a decision time. He's calling his listeners to make a choice. He's making a very clear call, a concise call, to what it means to be one of those who will follow him on this way, a call to those that day and in ours who would be his disciples. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but uh, it's a life and a story that's incredibly powerful. He was a German pastor and theologian and he writes about this particular passage from the Sermon on the Mount in his book called The Cost of Discipleship. He said this, he said, The way, meaning Jesus' way, the way is unutterably hard, and at every moment we are in danger of straying from it. If we regard this way as one, we follow in obedience to an external command. If we are afraid of ourselves all the time, it is indeed an impossible way, but, I love this, he says, but if we behold Jesus Christ going on step by step, we shall not go astray. In fact, this idea of the narrowness of the way with regard to this upside-down kingdom living, this continued to be something that was brought up again and again in Jesus' continued ministry beyond what we see here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It comes up again in Luke's gospel, a little bit later on in Jesus' um, ministry, he says, Then Jesus went through the towns and the villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. You know why he's going to Jerusalem, right? He's going to Jerusalem because he's going to die. But as he's making his way to Jerusalem, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And he said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. So let's, let's just be real about this for a moment. Exactly what is Jesus saying here in this point of the Sermon on the Mount? What Jesus is coming after in that day and in ours is something that's literally part and parcel of what it means to be an American. That's, that's what Jesus is pointing to right now. That's the idea, this idea that you and I prefer to have lots of choices, right? Seriously, we, we live for choices. 
That's a big part of what it means to be an American. Consider uh, the following choices at kind of a typical American supermarket or maybe a big box store, right? Anybody here use Crest toothpaste? Anybody Crest? Did you know there are 27 varieties of Crest toothpaste? 27 varieties of toothpaste, right? Anybody, I know one because uh, Thanksgiving's coming up. Anybody use Campbell's soup? Yeah, Campbell's soup. Yeah, there's 53 varieties of Campbell's soup. Lots of choices. Tropicana, pure premium orange juice. You can get eight different sizes, eight sizes of juice that go from eight ounces to 128 ounces of juice. This juice, one juice, one brand. Breyers ice cream, I, that's my favorite ice cream. Breyers, by, by, all, by all, all time. My mom's fault, she started me young. Breyers ice cream. There is natural, French, half the fat, no sugar added, extra creamy, homemade, lactose free, carb smart. That's just vanilla, right? Um, how about this? Anybody here use uh, uh, laundry soap? You, you use laundry soap, wash your clothes? Liquid laundry detergent, Tide. You have original scent, plus Febreze, plus Febreze Sport, free and gentle, plus bleach alternative, cold water, clean breeze, mountain spring, plus downy. With that. Folks, I went through this list and was blown away by the number of choices. This is what it means for us. We, we would go crazy if we didn't have all these choices. And Jesus is directly challenging this whole idea that we have multiple choices when it comes to living for him, when it comes to being part of his upside-down kingdom. He says the easy path is to be avoided. We're to avoid that easy path. Think about it another way. Jesus has been teaching us through the Sermon on the Mount which is the easy path or broad road to destruction? Is loving your enemies? Is that the easy path? Or hating your enemies? That seems like a broad road. How about suing someone, taking them to court? That seems like a pretty broad road. The narrow path? is seeking to be active in being reconciled. How about being judgmental? Toward, that seems pretty broad. No, the, the hard path is seeking and learning to be humble. I, th I think you get the idea. It's difficult. It's difficult. But just a side note on this whole part of this being difficult. What would it cost? What would it look like? Uh, if you weren't interested in discipleship, what does non-discipleship being developed and becoming more like Jesus, what would that cost? What might, we, what might be the price of being a non-disciple? Well, there's a couple of things. Discipleship, non-discipleship means you lose abiding peace. Non-discipleship means you lose a life penetrated throughout by love. Non-discipleship means faith that sees everything in light of God's overriding governance for good. You lose that. Hopefulness that stands firm in the most discouraging circumstances. That's the cost of non-discipleship. Power to do what's right and withstand the forces of evil. If you're not actively being discipled, you cannot do those things. That's the cost of non-discipleship. In short, it cost exactly what Jesus said he came to bring to everyone. What did Jesus say? I have come that they may have life. And <laughs> this is the cool part. Jesus didn't start, didn't stop at just having life. He said, I want you to have life to the full. That's what discipleship, that's what the narrow gate leads us to. It's also critical to remember here is this verse that 
While the gate to life is narrow and difficult to find, the easier road, um, I might even say kind of the popular road, is the one that leads to forever pain and destruction. However, however, I, I know that this is probably true for me, many of us are guilty of thinking about that, uh, that narrow road in a manner that's uh, similar to what I read something that C.S. Lewis had said. If you know that name, C.S. Lewis, a British writer and, and scholar, he wrote a, a book, maybe you've heard The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote this in his autobiography that when he was a schoolboy, thinking about this narrow, uh, this narrow uh, gate and this narrow road, he wrote this. He said, he began to broaden his mind when he was young. He said, I was soon, in the famous words, altering, I believe, to one does feel. And oh, he said, the relief of it. From the tyrannous noon of revelation, I passed into the cool evening twilight of higher thought, where there was nothing to be obeyed and nothing to be believed except what was either comforting or exciting. See, the upside-down kingdom calls us to reckon with reality. That we, we have to decide. We have to make a choice, a choice. Jesus invites us to carefully consider life and this narrow gate. Then Jesus immediately explains what this narrow gate, precisely what it leads to. This narrow gate leads to life. It leads to life. Again, verse 14 from uh, Matthew chapter 7. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Jesus is now getting down, he's getting to the nitty gritty, what it means to be a citizen of the upside down kingdom. Because in a few chapters later on, Jesus explains that this narrowing of the road foreshadows something for his listeners. And that foreshadowing, many of us are familiar with. This is what the narrowing of the road foreshadows. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And when Jesus took up his cross, if you know the story, it was a cross that led to his death. That's the cost. And then over in Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus says, whoever wants to meet my disciple must deny themselves, take up my cross, and follow me. I'm not going to lie to you. That's a significant call. Denying yourself, taking up your cross, following Jesus. You know, um, I was struck a few weeks ago when I was putting this together, coming on this journey with Jesus and making this decision to live as a citizen of the upside down kingdom. He's He's giving us very clear indications of exactly what's at stake. That's what I love about Jesus. Jesus didn't cut corners. Jesus told us exactly what to expect. If we were going to follow him, if we were going to live for him, he was very, very clear. And I remembered as um, I was putting this together, I remembered one of my favorite um, albums from the band U2, which is the best band of all time in the world, if you've never heard me say that. you know. But, but I, was, I was thinking of a song that they, an album um, called All That, all that we can't leave behind. And in an interview, Bono was the lead singer, um, Paul Hewson, if you want a little trivia clue. His real name is Paul Hewson. Remember that. That might make you some money one day. Bono spoke of the book of Corinthians being the source of his inspiration for some of the lyrics to the song that he wrote called Leave It Behind. He said, leave it behind. You've got to leave it behind. All that you can fashion, all that you can make, all that you can build, all that you can break, all that you measure and all that you steal, all that you feel, all this you can leave behind. All that you reason, 
all that you care. It's only time. And I'll never fill up all my mind. All that you sense, all that you speak, all that you dress up, and all that you scheme, all that you create, and all that you wreck, all that you hate. It sure sounds to me that if we were to engage with what Bono and his bandmates are singing about here, the path to life, the narrow road, is the road that opens up to us. On the other hand, as I read about this narrow road leading to life, I, I recognize that there have been times in my own life when I believed, surely, surely there's a road that leads to life. But maybe just maybe there's something like a shortcut. What shortcuts? Well, my family will tell you I'm the master of bad shortcuts. Well, we'll just go around it, you know. You may be familiar with this account of a shortcut. In the summer of 1846, there was a party of 89 migrants. They were headed west along the 2,170-mile-long Oregon Trail. Ever heard of the Oregon Trail? Anybody? Oregon Trail? Yeah. They were tired, they were hungry, and they were behind schedule. And so they decided at Fort Bridger, Wyoming, to travel to their final destination. They were trying to get to California. They were going to take a shortcut, right? Um, it was called the Hastings Cutoff. And so they chose to make an alternative route um, that its namesake, Lansford Hastings, he had claimed it would shave off at least 300 miles from their journey. And the party believed that this detour would save more than a month's time. And they were wrong. The Hastings Cutoff turned out to be a waterless, wide-open stretch of the Great Salt Lake Desert. Anybody ever been to the Salt Lake area of the country? It's straight-up desert. And they thought this was a shortcut. And it was a shortcut that Hastings himself had never traveled. He simply looked at a map of the route that a previous settler by the name of John Fremont had taken years earlier across the Great Salt Lake Desert. Hastings, <laughs> Hastings then wrote a guidebook which said it would be quicker and easier than the standard trail. That's just, you know, somebody who has no idea what they're talking about, trying to tell you something this, that informative, right? Hastings didn't realize that that trail that he was writing about, that this uh, gentleman, John Fremont, had taken a few years earlier, Fremont almost died taking that trail. And so, by the time this original group, the Donner Reed party they finally made it to the sierra nevada mountains the shortcut had not saved them weeks it had cost them weeks snow fell trapped the travelers that's when the most infamous and deadly part of their story began when the members of the party began starving to death they ate the remains of those who had died to stay alive the shortcut supposedly was an easier way of doing something have often produced disastrous results. There is a person, a man by the name of Rob Sweeten, he's a Bureau of Land Management and Administrator, and he said this, it's obvious that the immigrants were in need of shorter routes to save time and money, especially when you figure they're traveling like 15 miles a day and facing challenges like changing weather and river conditions, conflicts with indigenous people. Such difficulties often led them to attempt to find an easier route, a shorter route, though in many cases the new route turned out to be much harder. As a matter of fact, I think that's what Jesus is saying when he talks about the narrow gate and the narrow road. You want to take that other road? That's the one that's real danger to you. The way that I'm offering you is the one that leads to life. I 
Our God is good. That's why he says this. Furthermore, tell the people. This is what the Lord says. See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. God is the ultimate map builder. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. This is the part about God that I really love. He's really specific and he's really clear and he's really forthright. God doesn't play. He doesn't try and trick us. He doesn't bait and switch. You get familiar with that term? He's very, very truthful. He's exceptionally honest and forthright. How many of you use Google Maps? Stick your hand up, nice and high. Remember when we used to live like pirates? You remember that? Like we were driving our cars like we were literal pirates. Big old map <laughs> pulled out, you know? <laughs> what, were we, what, what were we thinking, right? Now it's like, doot, 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 you know? Turn left at the next stoplight. You know, it's, it's great, you know, right? There was a gentleman who uh, attempted to cross a collapsed bridge in his vehicle. And the family of that man is suing Google. I use, I use Google Maps. Suing Google because the map directed him to do what he did. The map directed him to take those directions. Philip Paxson, he was using Google Maps to navigate while driving home from his daughter's ninth birthday party when the app diverted him, directed him to cross a bridge that had collapsed nearly a decade prior but lacked any kind of warning to the danger. So you get this, right? Google is telling someone to take a road that for over a decade you've not been able to cross. The directions were wrong. The directions not only were wrong, but they were what? They were deadly. Paxson family attorney Robert Zimmerman said this, for years before this tragedy, Hickory residents, that's the name of the town, Hickory residents had asked for the road to be fixed or properly barricaded before someone was hurt or killed and their demands were unanswered. We discovered that Google Maps misdirected motorists like Mr. Paxson onto the collapsed road for years, despite receiving complaints from the public demanding that Google fix its maps and directions to mark the road as closed. In addition, Google and its parent company, Alphabet, weird name, but its parent company, Paxson Family, is suing those uh, two companies and some local companies. They said are responsible for maintaining that bridge but failed to put up any warning signs to, or any kind of safety barriers. barriers. And the lawyer Paxson said, I can't understand how those responsible for the GPS directions and the bridge could have acted with so little regard for human life. No one should ever lose a loved one this way. Friends, I'm telling you, no one of us should ever lose someone that we care deeply about because we don't tell them that Jesus says there's a narrow way and there's a narrow road. And it's a road that leads to life. Can I tell you about it? We get to be the ones to help folks not take the wrong directions and go off a bridge, <laughs> right? We who are the upside down citizens, upside down kingdom citizens, we're intended, we are intended. This is a... It is, in fact, a minority movement. And, and quite currently, in many ways, we are a despised minority movement. 
But that's what we're called to be. Following Jesus on a road that is less traveled, right? But it's the way that leads to life. And the difference being on the right road makes, <laughs> that's all the difference. That's all the difference. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful that you have shown us through the cross, through your word, what it means to be on the road to life. Lord, it, it seems counterintuitive in so many ways. But God, it is a way that you yourself walked. <laughs> we are so grateful that you love us that much, that you've shown us the way, and you beckon to humanity. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and burdened. Follow me, and I will lead you, not just to life, but life more abundantly. That's a promise from the God of the universe to someone like me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We love you, Lord. We are amazed at how you love us. We pray this in the name of the one who beckons us to follow through the narrow gate and the road that leads to life, Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen.